Thanks everybody for joining this webinar um, on harvesting child nutritional gains through the graduation approach, results from a randomized controlled trial on BRAC's targeting the ultra poor program. Um, I'm Lisa Hannigan. Uh, I'll be moderating the webinar. I work for Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT, um, as the director for the poverty and social transfers section. I've worked for, on social protection for the last decade or so, and in that time I've done a lot of work on graduation programs. And they're not a silver bullet to ending extreme poverty, but they have achieved some impressive, impressive results in some areas. And this webinar is going to allow us to take a closer look um, at the results in nutrition. So as a bit of background for those of you who are joining who are not SPEC members, this webinar is organised by the Social Protection for Employment Community, which is called SPEC. Um, SPEC is supported by DFAT and Germany's GIZ's Global Alliance for Social Protection. SPEC exists to facilitate South-South knowledge exchange on linking social protection to sustainable employment. And it's been organising a series of these webinars um, on this topic of social protection employment um, as one of the means of this knowledge exchange. And today's the fifth uh, webinar of this series. So we're going to be hearing in a moment from BRAC. Uh, BRAC is a Bangladesh-based international NGO, the largest uh, NGO in the world. BRAC's graduation approach, uh, which is focused on providing a pathway out of poverty to extremely poor households, has become globally recognised. Um, many countries have replicated this approach. I think it's over 40 now. Um, the programs are quite well evaluated, although the nutrition impact has never been a large focus of the evaluations. So today, colleagues from BRAC will present research findings on this nu nutrition impact. It's a particularly relevant issue as many, many developing countries grapple with how to improve child nutrition. So now to introduce the presenters and the discussant, we have Nazia Mokit, the Technical Specialist of BRAC USA. Nazia provides technical assistance to governments and NGOs implementing the graduation approach. She currently provides technical support to the government of Kenya on a graduation pilot that targets vulnerable women and youth and to the government of the Philippines on its social protection convergence strategy. Nazia has previously worked on the CGAP Ford Foundation graduation pilot in Yemen and with the World Bank. She holds a master's in international trade and development economics from George Washington University and a bachelor's in economics from Colgate University. Um, our next presenter is Wamak Raja, the senior research from BRAC Uganda. Wamak is an economist He's interested in health and poverty with extensive experience in impact evaluation using experimental and quasi-experimental methods in developing countries. He's currently overseeing quantitative research with a focus on livelihood and health outcomes in nine BRAC international countries. He's got a BA in economics from Ithaca College, New York, an MA in development economics from University of Sussex, UK, and a PhD in Development Health Economics from Erasmus University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and we have a discussant, Matthew Tasker. Uh, he's the Asia Regional Food Security and Livelihoods Advisor for Save the Children UK. Previously, Matthew worked for Save the Children Myanmar Country Office as the Food Security, Livelihoods and Social Protection Advisor, where he supported um, in design and implementing an urban graduation program and a maternal and child cash transfer intervention. He provided technical support to the government of Myanmar to adopt the maternal and child cash transfer model. Matthew has also worked for the Australian government on its aid program. Matt, Matthew is a graduate of University of Sydney in anthropology and obtained a Master of Philosophy in Environment and Social Development from the University of Cambridge. So, now, Nazia and Wama will introduce the graduation approach reasonably quickly for those of you not familiar with it, and then we'll present the study on the impact on nutrition and graduation approach. And as they're talking, um, everybody who's listening, feel free to use the chat function to ask any questions that you'd like to pose them. 
um, and we can ask those questions at the end. So do that at any time during the presentations. So with that, I'd like to hand over now to um, Nati and Wamak. Thank you, Lisa, and to everyone else for joining this webinar. Today, Wamak and I are going to discuss the ultra poor graduation approach and focus specifically on its impact on child nutrition. Next slide, please. So we've divided our presentation into three sections. First, I'm going to give you some background on the graduation approach, uh, focused mainly on its key components, its goals, um, and also share some evidence on its socioeconomic impact. And then I'll hand it over to Wamek to share findings from a randomized control trial that determines the effects of the graduation approach on child nutrition in Bangladesh. Lastly, um, I'll share further evidence from a BRAC graduation pilot in South Sudan and close with some key messages. Next slide, please. So before we talk about the graduation approach, uh, I just want to share some background on BRAC as an organization. We started as a relief initiative in 1972 in Bangladesh, and our primary goal is to empower people and communities through innovative poverty solutions. We have comprehensive programs on education, health, WASH, microfinance, and uh, among many others. And for the purpose of our presentation today, we're going to focus on BRAC's targeting the ultra poor program. Next slide. Since its inception, uh, BRAC has evolved into one of the largest development organizations in the world, um, and we have over 120,000 staff, reaching over an estimated 138 million people. We've also expanded our presence and are located in 11 countries across Asia and Africa. And in addition to the countries that you see on the slide here, uh, we also work in an advisory capacity in Kenya and Lesotho regarding the government-led adoption of the graduation approach. Next slide, please. In the late 1990s, um, we recognized that there was a gap in our ability to um, reach the ultra, the, the, the most destitute populations, uh, specifically in our ability of our uh, microfinance and health programs. And we found that a lot of these populations were not being picked up through our targeting mechanisms. And in some cases, we found that these programs were not really the best fit for the unique challenges that these populations face. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit um, about the profile of these destitute populations. Um, the World Bank's extreme uh, poverty line is set at $1.90 a day, and Brack uses the term ultra poor to describe those individuals who fall in the lowest subset of the extreme poor population. We find that ultra poor households um, or individuals are uh, typically food insecure, despite spending majority of their income on food. They're also disconnected from government services and underserved by markets. Um, they're very vulnerable to health shocks and natural disasters, and they live in hard to reach areas. They're also um, excluded or face social exclusion and come from predominantly female headed households. Since we are talking about nutrition today, I'd like to point out that each of these challenges that I mentioned can affect nutritional outcomes. For example, being vulnerable um, can lead to reduced food expenditure when exposed to shocks. And similarly, being excluded from uh, community or government programs or being located in an isolated um, area can limit one's access to health services and food transfers. And all of these would inevitably have an impact on nutrition. Next slide. To address the multidimensional attributes of ultra poverty that I just uh, mentioned, uh, in 2002, BRAC launched a holistic program known as Targeting the Ultra Poor or TUP. This program uses the graduation approach, which is defined as a set of time-bound and sequenced interventions that place ultra-poor households into sustainable livelihoods and also improves their resilience. Graduation is highly adaptable and will look different based on the context, but across the board, it is built on core elements of four um, key categories or uh, dimensions, and namely, being, uh, namely social protection, livelihoods promotion, financial inclusion, and coaching. Since the launch of uh, TUP in um, 2002, BRAC has reached over 1.7 million households, majority of whom are in Bangladesh, with a few others in TUP pilots in Afghanistan, Pakistan, South Sudan, and Uganda. And because of the success of the TUP program, uh, there has been um, replication adoption in uh, over 60 countries, um, sorry, in 60 programs, in over, in over 60 programs in 40 countries. 
And one thing I'd like to note here is that graduation is a complementary approach to social protection. It is not a substitute. And this is something that we'll discuss later in our presentation, but I just wanted to uh, make that note now. Next slide. So while the graduation interventions can change based on the context, um, this slide shows a typical combination of interventions in TUP. So prior to receiving any intervention, prior participants are ad identified through a three-step targeting process, which includes community mapping and wealth in ranking. And the purpose of the community mapping and wealth ranking is to really increase community buy-in and also reduce the probability of elite capture in identifying the ultra-poor households. In terms of interventions, TUP includes an asset transfer. Um, in Bangladesh, it's typically livestock or inventory for petty trade. There's also a stipend for the first couple of months to allow breathing room for the enterprises uh, before they start generating revenues. Um, there's savings support, there's access to health services, community linkages through committee, committees of local leaders, and personalized coaching over a period of two years. The coaching element here is really key because it not only helps participants troubleshoot any challenges and build their confidence, but it also exposes them to social and health messaging on WASH, maternal and child health, breastfeeding, and vitamin A administration, all of which are very key to um, adequate nutrition. Next slide, please. So what does success for a graduation participant really look like? Um, the outcomes are really measured uh, against a set of criteria uh, and here we have the graduation criteria in Bangladesh, and they measure uh, performance in food security, economic resilience, um, hygiene practices, social inclu inclusion, and positive behavior change. Um, and these criteria really depend on the profile of the household. So for example, the last set of criteria on school enrollment for children or um, absence of underage marriage or use of family planning will really apply to households that have children or adolescents uh, or um, uh, the families that are of reproductive age, or uh, women that are of reproductive age. And one thing I'd like to note here is that there are multiple pathways to improve nutrition and even indirect criteria, such as the um, criteria on decision-making power can lead to improved nutrition. Um, it's important to note here that, you know, graduation was not intended to specifically target malnutrition, but it does so through its holistic approach. And one thing that you know, I'm sure will come up a lot in this presentation is UNICEF's nutrition framework, which outlines that malnutrition can be reduced, reduced through measures such as food intake, health practices, behavioral change, and the environment. And as we can see through the interventions and also through the criteria of the graduation approach, these are all addressed through the program. Next slide, please. Brack and the London School of Economics hosted one of the longest longitudinal studies on graduation. They've covered over 21,000 households over a period of seven years. And the results were largely positive. And we saw that the, um, the impacts during graduation were sustained over um, a seven year period. And the seven year really is um, marked from the time when a participant enters the graduation program. And the results that we saw were that there were significant increases in work productivity, resilience, and household assets. There was also a more, participants also had access to more stable and secure employment. And we also found an improvement in social cohesion, gender empowerment, and a reduction in economic inequality. Next slide, please. So with, for this part, Wamek and I are going to talk about the graduation on child, impact of graduation on child nutrition, specifically in Bangladesh. Next slide. So let's first discuss the context around child nutrition. Um, so globally, of the 767 million people that live in extreme poverty, 50% um, are children or under the age of 18. And uh, it's safe to assume that uh, most of them are malnourished or suffer from undernutrition because poverty, as we know, is one of the key drivers of malnutrition. In Bangladesh itself, undernutrition um, is um, 40% of the children are malnourished or suffer from undernutrition. And undernutrition is typically measured um, by stunting, wasting, and being underweight. In Bangladesh, 40% uh, of under, uh, children under five are stunted and underweight, while 15% are fit, um, wasted. And this is a big problem because malnutrition leads to chronic health problems and impairs cognitive development among children. It can also have implications for long-term growth and pro productivity of a country. So if you find that a um, 
children are malnourished down the line, this is going to have implications for the growth of the country and the workforce uh, in that country. Malnutrition can also lead to an increase in um, health incidences, which would um, place a greater burden on the healthcare system for a country. And lastly, the other thing I'd like to mention is among young adults, malnutrition can lead to complicated pregnancies and low birth weight, and all can also increase the risk of maternal and child mortality. Next slide, please. The interventions that we see here um, are a combination from TUP's rural and urban program, and also an adapted TUP program that we will discuss later in the, um, in the presentation. Um, so one thing I'd like to point out is that graduation is a nutrition sensitive program in that it targets the ultra poor who are, who are largely mal malnourished, and it incorporates food security as one of its primary goals. But at the same time, graduation delivers nutrition specific interventions, such as coaching on breastfeeding, childcare, hygiene, and increased, increased access to healthcare. Uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Womack and you can actually switch over to the next slide. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good morning. So uh, thanks Nazia uh, for, for the comprehensive overview. <clears throat> so uh, as, as Nazia suggested that there is a comprehensive body of evidence uh, that uh, looks at outcomes such as uh, income, consumption, food security, life satisfaction, mental health in, uh, in six countries in the study done by uh, JPAL and uh, specifically in Bangladesh uh, done by LSE. But uh, th there's also a bit of a dearth of evidence when it, when it comes to the effects of uh, the, the, the graduation program on uh, nutrition status of its participants and more particularly if you want to think of it uh, from an intergenerational point of view, how does, it, how does uh, such a comprehensive program affect the nutrition status of children? So in this paper, uh, we, this is the first time a, a, a paper uh, looks at, uh, evaluates the effects of such a program on the nutrition status of children under five. And uh, we also look at the spillover effects of the program as, as uh, we know for a fact that uh, some exist as uh, we see through the LSE paper. And finally, uh, in the next step, we identify the pathways through which some of these uh, effects may have been channeled. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, now I'm going to kind of uh, give you a brief description of the setup of the experiment. So we used uh, 40 uh, administrative branches, uh, uh, 40 uh, in BRAC's administrative branches across 913 of the poorest districts in Bangladesh. And we used pairwise randomization where we selected uh, 40 branches uh, that were all eligible. And then we uh, randomly put 20, uh, we randomly allocated 22 control and 22 uh, treatment groups. And in each of the branches, we identified first uh, ultra poor households uh, selected through the three step uh, targeting mechanism that Nazia described. Then <clears throat> we identified other poor households uh, who were ident who met uh, the first two of the criteria but didn't meet the third. And finally, uh, we also randomly select 10% uh, of the non-poor or non-participant households in both treated and control areas. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the data uh, we, we used for this study was collected in 2007, 2009, and 2011. But uh, in this particular study, we only focus on 2007 and 2011 data points. So we collect the data uh, for 2000, about 2,700 children from ultra poor households, 5,100 households from other poor households, and 3,100 children uh, from non-poor households. Uh, as a part of the survey, we collected data on uh, the height, weight, and the age of the children, and we uh, created uh, constructed variables that represent uh, height for age, weight for age, and z-score. And uh, using the standard uh, minus two standard deviation cutoff point, we identified the percentage that were stunted, wasted, or underweight. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I uh, apologize uh, for the equations. It's just a basic uh, uh, OLS setup. So uh, in, in, in our models, we control for uh, baseline household characteristics, such as uh, characteristics of the household head, sex, uh, education, socioeconomic status, and we also control for the age and the sex of the child. Um, 
then we look at uh, sorry. Uh, so essentially, uh, the the, the uh, uh, coefficient beta two is what identifies uh, the effects of the TUP program. We prefer to use uh, village level fixed effects because a lot. Otherwise, if if we were to opt for individual fixed effects, then a lot of our sample would either drop out because they weren't born when the program started, or they aged out of the specific age groups. But uh, uh, of, of more interest, of course, is uh, we we look at the heterogeneity of uh, effects across uh, the household sex of the household head and we also look at uh, the heterogeneity across the child uh, the child sex so one of the reasons we look at the first is because uh, the, there is a, a, a body of evidence that suggests that when women are at the has at the head of the household uh, they're they're usually uh, seen to be better at allocating household resources for uh, the greatest benefit for all members of the household. So we wanted to see if that is indeed the case. And uh, for the latter, there is a strong uh, male preference uh, when, when it comes to children. But uh, the graduation program specifically addresses this issue by uh, kind of uh, increasing salience to the needs of uh, uh, the, the, the girls. So we want to see if indeed the program has worked and that if it has worked there should be no difference between uh, the effects between uh, the girl and the boy child next slide please so here <clears throat> it's it's a graphic representation of the summary statistics but we from here we can already start to see uh, some of the effects so for instance uh, in the top row what, you, what you're looking at is uh, the nutrition status of children living in ultra participant ultra poor households. So as you can see, there's a clear overlap between the treated households in 2007, control households in 2007, and control households in uh, 2011. But in the treated households, you already start to see a shift for the weight for height. And you see the same effects for weight for age. Now, in the bottom row is uh, what we're looking for is essentially the spillover effect. So the children living in non-participant households in treated areas. Over there, we start to see similar trends. But uh, in, the, in the next slide, uh, we will see the actual point estimates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, overall, we find that uh, in, in, in the participant households, the likelihood of wasting uh, decreases by eight percentage points. The likelihood of uh, being underweight reduces by 19 percentage points. And uh, children and female, uh, we find in, 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 uh, in the heterogeneity of effects that children uh, in female households benefited significantly more uh, than in male-headed households. Sorry, it, it, it's not in the slide, but indeed we don't find any effects uh, in any uh, gender differentials between uh, the sex of the child, so which is uh, which is which is great news for us. Um, in terms of the pathways of effects, we find that uh, <clears throat> uh, they receive uh, so uh, new mothers receive a lot of counseling in addition to uh, uh, financial and in kind support. So we find that uh, this increases the duration of exclusive breastfeeding for by seventy three days for the participant households and fifty nine days for the other poor households. Uh, there is a lot of encouragement to administer vitamin A, for instance, within six months of uh, the child's birth. We find that there is a huge uh, 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 jump in, in the uptake of the vitamin A supplements. So 26 percentage points for the ultra poor households and 20 percentage points for the other poor households. Finally, I mean, uh, it, this has been looked at other paper, but we do confirm it that uh, there is a significant increase in food security and also for uh, other, other wash indicators. Next slide, please. And now I hand it back to Nazia. Thanks, Wilming. Can we have the next slide? Yeah, or the slide is perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that um, that we have from a graduation pilot in South Sudan that shows similar effects to what uh, Wamik had just shared um, from the RCT in Bangladesh. 
So in 2013, BRAC implemented a graduation pilot or TUP pilot um, in South Sudan. And halfway through the implementation, the participants faced a host of extremely challenging um, conditions. There was hyperinflation and increased security risks, which disrupted access to the market. And despite these challenges, we found a significant impact on the participants and their children and also the general communities. Children from TUP households were um, found to be less likely to be underweight compared to those who didn't participate. Um, in addition, we also saw spillover effects as a result of uh, the mothers or the female participants who were trained through the program. So um, these participants were getting training on social and health messaging and they were sharing it with the broader community. And so we did see a positive spillover effect on the rest of the community in South Sudan. Next slide, please. Um, given the impact of uh, graduation and nutrition, I just want to um, talk briefly about a pilot that explicitly targets uh, pregnant and lactating ultra poor women with children um, between the ages of zero to 36 months. This is a pilot that is a joint effort with um, uh, by World Food Program and BRAC. It's known as TUPN, TUP Nutrition. Um, and the goal of this pilot is to improve nutrition practices of pregnant women and children in the thousand day window between a woman's pregnancy and a child's second birthday. And this is really seen as a critical time for a child's development. Um, in this pilot, um, in addition to uh, typical interventions, uh, participants also received fortified supplementary food, such as rice enhanced with essential micronutrients. Um, and they also received behavior change communication on uh, maternal and child health, hygiene and child feeding practices. And it's important to note here that both men and women were uh, engaged in these BCC trainings. Uh, the evidence from this pilot is not available yet, but, um, it, but when it does come out, um, uh, it will help in improving the design of development programs and its ability to um, impact nutrition. Next slide, please. This is our last slide, um, and, and I just want to share um, the key takeaway uh, based on the evidence that we've um, seen today is that graduation can have a positive long-term health effect on participants and communities at large. Um, and in doing so, it has the ability to reduce intergenerational poverty. Now, keeping this in mind, we have a few um, key, mess key messages. Um, first, uh, pilots such as TUPN that I just um, uh, talked about um, that target pregnant women and mothers with infants can really magnify the positive impact and spillover effects that we're already seeing in the TUP program. Um, second, even though graduation is not a health-centered program, um, the fact that it does address many of the underlying um, causes of poor health and nutrition makes it a very effective solution in reducing vulnerability to shocks. So um, from a policy perspective, it might actually be more cost efficient to allocate resources towards integrated, integrated development programs like graduation um, to improve nutrition and to reduce the incidence of illness. And this would um, subsequently reduce the burden on the healthcare system um, and uh, as a result would reduce costs down the line. And lastly, as I mentioned this before, um, graduation is really seen as a complementary approach to social protection schemes. And while NGO-led programs like uh, TUP are important and often make up for the capacity that an intensive program like graduation might need, um, it's really government adoption for some, and su government support for these programs that would allow impacts to be scaled on a national level. Um, and and on the other on the other side, you know, since we did talk about uh, research a lot today, I just want to um, you know point out some research implications as well. Um, it's important that uh, you know resources are allocated towards uh, further study of these nutritional impacts. Um, you know, a lot of these studies are short term, and you know, graduation hasn't been around for uh, for long enough to get. Uh, significant sustainable incomes on nutritional outcomes. Um, but, you know, this is a, definitely an area that should be explored further. And, uh, you know, we definitely encourage uh, resources towards uh, research on child nutritional outcomes over a long period of time to see if these effects that we're seeing in TUP are sustainable over a long period of time. Uh, in addition, just tracking um, child nutritional outcomes beyond stunting, wasting and un underweight, um, you know, if we're looking at cognitive development, those are key uh, indicators as well that would sort of shed more light um, on the effect of graduation on nutrition. Um, Wamek, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but um, that's it from my end. Nope, uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Great. Nanza. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Nazia. Thanks, Wamek. 
Um, I'd like now to invite Matthew Tasker for comments. Matthew is going to um, highlight the global context of nutrition um, and make comments on the presentation. And while he's doing that, I, and I do invite you to um, to submit any questions that you have uh, after Matthew speaks, we'll be going to questions. So any questions do you have for Nazia, Wamek or Matthew, please um, please do type them into the, the chat bar. Okay, over to you, Matthew. Great, right, thank you, Lisa. Um, just wait for my slides to come up. Um, yeah, just as we wait for the slides to come up, um, I'm going to jump into, as Lisa said, a bit of a framing the situation and of nutrition challenges overall before I jump into reflections on the presentations by Nazi and Mamak. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? Matthew, it's Lisa here. Maybe, maybe just start, yeah, and um, and they will. Um, your slide hopefully will come up as you as you're speaking. That's okay. Yeah, I'll jump into it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, first thing, what I wanted to do, I'll just pull this up on my screen. So, I wanted to give a quick snapshot of the global situation, um, which is kind of relating to to what BRAC is doing now and this research around nutritional outcomes. Um, and so in terms of a bit of a snapshot of the kind of global challenge we're facing now, um, in 2016, it was estimated that around just over 50 million under five children were suffering from acute malnutrition and almost 17 million were suffering from severe acute malnutrition. And globally, his estimate was about 154 million children under five were suffering from stunting, which represents a prevalence rate of around 23%. So as a kind of a global picture, we are dealing with a, a pretty wide scale challenge in terms of addressing nutritional outcomes for under five children in particular. I also want to take a very quick note around the humanitarian context. And whilst uh, today we're primarily discussing poverty alleviation programs through the BRAC presentations, um, I think it's a good to note that children in humanitarian contexts are particularly vulnerable to undernutrition. And in 2013, it was estimated that around 65% of children living in conflict zones were chronically undernourished. And displaced populations are just by definition um, far more vulnerable and marginalized with higher rates um, of infection, non-communicable diseases, and undernutrition. And definitely the prevalence of stunting and wasting is much higher in states that are being designated as fragile. So I think we can learn a lot from the presentations and the research done by BRAC and other partners around what we could do in, in potentially adapting some of these programs for um, protracted situations where displaced populations are um, unable to access certain services or in um, situations that are quite extreme. So I think that's just a general note in terms of learning we could take forward, especially with um, quite a large scale protracted crises happening globally at the moment. Um, drilling in a little bit more, I wanted to um, more re reiterate what came out of the presentations around the first thousand days and, and maternal undernutrition. I mean, this is a very big area of focus for Save the Children. I'm really happy to see this coming out of these presentations. Undernutrition itself is estimated to be an underlying cause of about all, uh, half of all child deaths. So it has a huge impact on child mortality rates. Stunting contributed to between 1 and 1.7 1 and 1 uh, million child deaths in 2011, which is between 15 to 70 percent of child deaths, while wasting is believed to contribute to about 800,000 child deaths, um, which is about 12 percent of um, all deaths of under five children. So again, stunting, wasting um, have major impacts on children. I think this is again coming out in these presentations, which is great to see BRAC looking at these particular indicators. And there is plenty of evidence now coming out that the thousand day period is essential for tackling 
um, undernutrition in children and stunting in particular, um, ensuring cognitive and physical um, uh, development is at its optimum. And about 70% of all stunting takes place before a child turns two years old. So definitely that thousand day window from conception to 24 months of age is absolutely critical for any of these programs. So I'm very happy to see that this is something that BRAC and other partners are starting to drill down and look at specifically in terms of interventions. And that relates very heavily to maternal undernutrition. And this can have a, a very negative impact on uh, the development of a fetus. And this is vitally important that we, we focus on women of reproductive age and particularly adolescent girls, which is something that SAVE and I believe BRAC is starting to look at um, very much. Um, so it is a big challenge. And, and this um, slide here, I think we're two slides ahead of you on that one, um, is that stunting and wasting are globally recognized. Um, the World Health Assembly has global targets on these two and they have been incorporated into the SDGs, particularly goal two. Um, but unfortunately, estimates suggest that we're a bit off track in terms of meeting these targets. Well, actually, we're, we're potentially quite a way off track from, from getting there. So in terms of resource allocation and more focus, this is something that is of critical importance right now. So I think it's very timely that BRAC is starting to look into um, the graduation approach in relation to this topic. Finally, if we can go to my last slide, um, I have, we could have that one up. Um, we're dealing with a highly complex issue when we talk about um, nutrition outcomes. Um, and in particular, we're looking at many levels of potential activities um, which are interrelated in terms to look at stunting in particular and other um, wasting and other nutritional outcomes. There needs to be rigorous contextual analysis and this generally needs to be periodic, uh, like barrier analysis or formative research when you're beginning your projects. Ongoing and relatively intensive interpersonal engagement is needed to address a whole host of behavioral dynamics. Um, so social cultural practices um, can have a huge impact uh, through food taboos and um, just kind of the way people perceive and think they should be um, practicing infant and young child feeding or exclusive breastfeeding and the like. Um, I think this has come out in the presentation as well that gender is a really important component of this um, and so having a very strong gender centered approach is really important. Um, the linkages with multiple service providers, it's we need to work with development partners, potentially with community based organizations, civil society and different government entities from social protection um, to health. So, you know, departments of social welfare, Ministry of Health, if there's nutrition centers. So it does require a lot of stakeholder engagement for sustainability. And finally, which was um, highlighted in the presentations that the connection to relevant social protection schemes is really important, especially for ultra poor households that may move out of the worst kind of level of poverty, but um, will probably need continued help and support through government mechanisms. So kind of taking this last slide and reflecting on the presentations, I really want to say that I'm um, considering the, the, the challenge that we're faced with globally, I'm really happy to see this kind of research coming through BRAC right now. I think it's a really positive step moving away or moving beyond simply um, household level economic indicators, um, as was highlighted in the presentations, that we're digging deeper into the intra household dynamics, um, particularly around children under five and um, women of reproductive age. So I think these are core areas that need to be addressed and are already being looked at through BRAC. And something to say, the children is doing a lot of work on now. Um, I think the results for me from the programs are very interesting. I shared some of this with our nutrition colleagues prior to this webinar, just to kind of reflect and have a bit of dialogue. And there's some what we found is that, I mean, the results make sense to us and they seem to sit together quite well. And I think they really highlight the interrelation or the relationships that exist between these different indicators. So for example, we see some really great progress on underweight and that can be really a reflection of the improvement in um, wasting status. So these kind of move back and forth and kind of, you can have a positive effect in one area which leads on or a knock-on effect to another area or another indicator in terms of undernutrition. Um, these, for me and for my colleagues, suggested that this kind of food security stabilization or increasing um, food security level at the household and potentially better IYCF or infant and young child feeding practices are drivers um, tackling wasting in particular. So I think that, is um, something that comes out strong in these presentations and is really positive to see. Um, 
the interesting thing is I didn't see too much on stunting, and uh, I did look at a paper in relation to this, and it seemed that stunting, there wasn't anything statistically significant in relation to stunting, which wasn't too surprising for us um, due to the complexity outlined in this last slide. It is extremely hard to tackle stunting, and it can take quite some time. So I think um, this could be related to drivers from sanitation or soil contamination, particularly environmental aspects. It can sometimes be outside the remit of what a program can do. So I think as a next step in, in this type of research, I think we need to drill down a bit more on, on how we can tackle stunting overall, because this seems to be something that the programs hasn't been able to address yet, but there's definitely opportunities there, I think, to build on what positive progress is already coming out in relation to underweight, uh, birth weight, and wasting status. Um, and I think looking back at some other impact evaluations, um, particularly some of the World Bank's work looking at uh, different programming uh, globally, it's definitely true that we may see anthropometric outcomes that are going in a positive way um, under a randomized control trial in one area that doesn't work in the same way in another area. And I think it's a very localized context um, when it comes to nutrition. And this is why I think the BRAC approach tied or into a social protection scheme could be very interesting in the fact that it is able to work at so many different levels, both across economic strengthening components and trying to focus more on child sensitive issues around under five nutrition, for example, in this case. Um, again, I think one of the biggest challenges we face with our programming in other contexts and would have effect on, on these indicators that we're looking at through this research is the ability of these programs to have this interpersonal coaching. And I think this is a huge component of the graduation approach and it's something that I uh, think is vitally important in other programming we do, which is more of a cash plus approach where we look at activities um, related to social behavior change communication with cash transfers that are frequent and predictable. And I think, this is something that came out of research on the BRAC approach very recently, um, and that was through the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth, which had a great series of papers looking at some of this progress, particularly on economic indicators, but also nutrition. And I think it was clear there that governments are picking up the graduation approach. I think they estimated a third of these programs are now run by government entities, which is a really positive sign. However, in many of those cases where governments take up the graduation model, they don't do the entire model. And usually the first thing to be cut is the human resources component. Um, that is generally, um, which can make up generally around 40% of a budget on average. So I think this is something we need to be advocating for and showing through this research that the social behavior change communication and these uh, working intensively with households and with communities is a, a core or critical component for ensuring that we get behavioral change um, over one, two, three years plus. And I think this is something that we have faced in the context where I work in Myanmar, um, where governments are keen to work on this and do recognize the issue of stunting. And I think they are recognizing um, these kind of graduation models as being extremely useful and can actually lead to great change, both economic and we're seeing now potentially for under five and particularly under two children in terms of nutritional outcomes. Um, however, it's very difficult for them to mobilize the human resources that uh, nonprofit organizations and other development partners may be able to use. And that's where I think this connection to social protection schemes is something we need to look at um, a lot more seriously, how these link up and how governments can sustain this type of progress and, this, and these type of findings without the ability to potentially mobilize um, the same human resources that uh, BRAC or Save the Children or other large development partners are able to do. Um, yeah, so I think for me, they were the main situation, the main pieces I kind of picked up from both presentations. Um, again, I have to say that I find this to be a really positive step to be looking through more of a child sensitive lens. Um, and as was in the relation to the, the beginning of that, the first part of the presentation that children are, um, the children in these households that are ultra poor will be with some of the most vulnerable in terms of populations we work with. Um, and in terms of intergenerational change, tackling stunting is gonna be a huge win in terms of longer economic gains 
um, for those children, especially when we look at it from a social protection lens of a life cycle approach. Stunting the first thousand days is the foundation piece for the life cycle approach. It kind of sets up that child and, and their well-being for the longer term. So I think in terms of uh, if you look at it from a cost benefit ratio, you're trying to look at the economic rationale for this. Um, when we look at programs like the graduation model that can seem quite expensive for governments um, and for development partners, and we have to remind ourselves that there is great scope um, to have long-term gains from this and, and to look past the, the house by house kind of economic allocations in order to to make these um, make this progress in nutrition and economic indicators. So I think I might leave it there. That's the, my main kind of takeaways and comments on that in relation to the, the overall challenges we're facing. Um, again, very positive to see this coming out. I think this is something we can learn from and see how this sits within um, government um, social protection um, frameworks. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. That was really, really useful. Um, I guess uh, leading on from what you said, maybe we would just go straight into something you brought up on um, on stunting and maybe pass back to Womak and Nasia to just see if there's anything more they had to say on um, on the findings around stunting. Nasia, should I, should I say something then? Uh, sure, go ahead. So uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we, we, we didn't focus on it because uh, uh, Matthew's absolutely right. We didn't find any effects on stunting. So in this case, uh, we, we can kind of uh, speculate as to why this may have been. One may have been uh, uh, we didn't get enough kids early enough within the thousand day process to, to uh, uh, kind of over, overcome that issue. This is a, a stunting is a, is, is, is a global concern right now because uh, only a handful of uh, programs ha have actually um, been able to affect uh, the stunting rates in, in developing countries. So in this particular instance, so that was one of the reasons. Another one is um, our, our coefficients were positive. So overall, we do find that um, it suggests that there should be uh, uh, a significant effect but we find no significance so that may have been driven to some degree by the lack of power because we we needed to have a lot more kids in our sample uh for for it to be to to, to become uh, statistically significant at this stage it's it's still very speculative and 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 i'm not sure uh, uh what else to say to that but uh you're absolutely right this is the target we should be driving towards if we can uh effectively address the stunting rate the others will uh, kind of follow suit so yeah that that that, that should be the uh, new global agenda at this stage nazia nazia i don't want to i, I want to if you, you want to add something to that no that, that was clear thanks okay um just going to the next question we had um a couple of similar ones around um the behavior change communication and whether you were able to maybe talk a little bit more about the um, the accompanying behavior change communication on nutrition within the program and is it a mix between um, wash food nutrition and then specifically for the counseling of new mothers um, is it related to psychosocial support Support, or is it more around nutri straight nutrition knowledge? Thanks, Lisa. I can um, I can take this question, and if anybody else wants to um, chime in, please feel free to do so. Um, regarding the BCC or the behavior change <clears throat> behavior change communication, that's uh, very specific to the uh, WFP and BRAC pilot. Um, but you know, we do have similar interventions in BRAC pilots where we have training on uh, nutrition and uh, maternal and child health. Um, and it's, you know, the, the advantage of having the BCC uh, or, you know, training on these issues 
uh, really is not only that you know the mothers have access to this information that they might not have known before, um, but also that they get to interact with other mothers or uh, other participants who are sort of going through the same challenges that they are. Uh, so um, you know that's one thing you know in, in the sense that they're you know getting the knowledge, but then also building networks. Um, regarding the psychosocial support, um, that's really a, a key a critical element of the TUP or the graduation program. Uh, at large is, um, you know, the, these mentors or these uh, frontline staff um, who are really the point of the only point of contact that participants have um, th with this program. They, um, you know, follow up with these participants on a regular basis. In some cases, it's weekly or some cases it's biweekly. And not only do they provide guidance on, um, you know, asset management, they also follow up on just their unique, um, just their you know, individual conditions. So they're checking on whether their children are going to school, what, you know, whether there are any health problems in the house, you know, what are the general hygiene conditions, whether there are any problems um, with their spouses. And, uh, you know, they're able to offer them guidance and also boost their confidence. So um, that's a level of psychosocial support that's very unique to the graduation approach um, and is something that's very critical. Um, and that's, I don't know if that answers the question regarding um, the psychosocial support for new mothers. I don't know if uh, Matt or Wamik, feel free to add if you have anything else to add. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, Nazi, you're absolutely uh, right. And for the spillover effects, so just one of the pathways of these behavioral changes is uh, it's not really spillover effects technically because a lot of these messages, uh, when, when these mentors go to these households, they're usually sitting in the front yard or uh, somewhere not inside uh, the households because the households tend to be quite small. So uh, as a result, you tend to see a lot of uh, neighbors congregating around uh, that, that, that event. So what happens is uh, you, you, you tend to see a lot more dissemination of uh, these messages uh, throughout the community. And uh, as, as a further proof of this idea, you tend to see that the spillover effects are typically restricted to uh, other poor households who live around uh, them and doesn't necessarily transmit to better off households who live in bigger houses, maybe even in a, a, a different neighborhood. So yeah, uh, I'm done, thanks. Great, thanks Wame. Um So we'll just have a follow-up question and um, it relates to something Matt brought up um, in terms of the cash plus approach and this being an, an approach that's increasingly being followed um, around the globe to I guess enhance some of the benefits of cash transfer programs. Um, so is there anything about this graduation model, this graduation approach um, in terms of its impact on nutrition um, that I guess you see that couldn't be replicated with just a, a straight cash transfer and some intensive behavioral change communication. Is there anything about this graduation approach that is different in terms of, I guess, the expected nutritional impacts that you would, um, you would be able to achieve? Um, I can, I can uh, take this question. Um, you know, I think the, cre uh, the critical element really would be uh, the coaching or the follow-up uh, component um, in the graduation program that's different um, and that's in addition um, to a typical cash transfer program. Um, and, you know, with the cash transfer program, you have uh, participants, you know, obviously getting uh, increased income and they're able to spend more on consumption. Uh, but with the graduation program, in addition to that, they actually have uh, frontline staff checking on them and <clears throat> you know, get, exposing them to messages on nutrition. So um, in Bangladesh, we actually have um, a nutrition plan send, set up for participants where they're, you know, um, told to eat a certain diet, um, a certain, you know, for a full week, you know, so on this day they would eat um, lentils, on the next day they would eat meat or uh, fish or, you know, um, et cetera. So uh, the participants, uh, the mentors actually follow up on that and sorry, the staff actually follow up on that. Um, so this, you know, shows that, you know, not only are they increasing their consumption, but they're also increasing dietary diversity, uh, which does have an impact on nutrition as well. Um, and, you know, the fact that um, participants are also exposed to messages on WASH um, and maternal and child health care um, and, you know, other um, attributes that, and other topics that 
affect nutrition, that's also something that's key that they might not have access to in a um, cash transfer program. And I think with the, what Womack mentioned with the spillover effects and when you have uh, communities that are congregating and being exposed to these messages and they have access to um, local leaders who are part of um, these village committees, um, you know, they do have access to government programs that they wouldn't have otherwise, but then they're also, um, you're able to um, effect change in a larger capacity because you are uh, congregating participants and non-participants in communities and discussing these key, key issues that can affect nutrition. In these uh, neighbor in these villages. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Did you have something to add, Womack? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, the, uh, that was Matthew. Oh, Matthew, go. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just wanted to um, just building off uh, Nazia's comments there, um, just in terms of the cash plus approach. Yeah, I think that's a really important point in terms of. I mean, for me, I feel like the debate is sitting between how much how much do we do with these programs? So the cash plus approach is kind of the modification of, of what were more traditional cash approaches where you gave cash, there's very limited interaction between the implementer and um, participants in the program, for example, or in the scheme. And the cash plus approach that say the children is using in various countries at the moment is essentially regular cash transfers with intensive um, household level or at least group level like mother to mother support group level um, engagement on social behavior change communication and generally that will work at the community level um, at the direct participant level with mothers and their children and also with um, husbands and other male uh, adults from the household so I think the cash plus approach is it's kind of a modification of, of the traditional cash transfer process where you're adding in a lot more of what some people would call a soft component but also it's a, a more reduced and focused um, in comparison to a graduation, the more holistic model where you're, you're working at many different levels and looking more at the overall household income as well. So I think it's a, for me, the debate, the interesting point in terms of next steps and working with governments is what is a cost effective model that can be sustainable? And is that a graduated approach that then is um, streamlined down to a cash plus approach over a longer term that governments are able to facilitate with less human resources? for example, and I think this is where, as I mentioned, the, the set of papers that came out on the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth that was looking at graduation and all the, the results from over the last decade. I think this is a really interesting um, next step in terms of the challenges to scaling this up and having governments adopt it. Um, so that's where the cash plus approach might be able to, to have a more long-term effect um, with the initial graduated approach used to kind of kickstart the economic stabilization at the household level for very poor households. But anyway, it's just food for thought in that sense. Um. Great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good point. Um, okay, so I mean, there is a lot of interest in um, the recognition that this, the, the intensive focus on um, um, coaching, behavior change, communication. Um, and we've got a question in from um, someone asking about just, I guess, the logistics of doing that. It says, it asks, it, well, the person asks, it seems like the field staff who do coaching have a lot of task responsibilities such as BCC, social integration, WASH, financial inclusion, etc. How does the project go about training staff in all of these areas? And are they BRAC staff? Um, what happens to them after the project? And I'm, I think there probably isn't an after yet. Um, but yes. Um, and one more, were they integrated under the government social protection program? So are there any links of, I guess, these staff with um, the broader social protection programs? Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, um, for for the BRAC TUP program, uh, the staff are um, you know retained as BRAC. So the the frontline staff are essentially BRAC staff, um, and they go through an intensive training process. You know, so not only do they have to get trained on livelihoods, um, they also have to get trained on the um, you know diverse social and health issues that they have to talk about, and also you know get trained on the key components of the graduation. 
uh, program. So there is a very intensive pro training program. Um, and you know, as you mentioned, Lisa, to the uh, question of whether they're retained, um, you know, the uh, TUP model is uh, being replicated every year and it's being expanded throughout the country. So the staff is retrained and you know, they're often transferred from one area to the other um, to work um, in the area where the graduation, uh, where the TUP program is being newly implemented. Um, but you know this is very specific to BRAC, and you know we do find models um, elsewhere. So you know where we do use extension workers from government programs, and you know the uh, the, uh, the point that Matthew made uh, in terms of you know reducing costs, um, you know because this is a very uh, intensive program that uh, is very resource heavy because of the coaching element. But at the same time, I do want to point out that this is a very critical component and is what makes graduation unique. But um, in, in some government programs or um, government adopted graduation programs where um, governments are partnering with NGOs, oftentimes you do have the option of using extension workers um, that work in agricultural um, programs in the government and that would cut down some of the costs because they're already trained, they already have the expertise and they can you know, provide expertise on a specific livelihoods, uh, a specific livelihood. Um, and similarly, you know, if you have uh, extension workers from a health program uh, in a government ministry, they can provide support on maternal and child health and also uh, provide messaging on um, WASH um, challenges. Uh, the other, uh, you know, the other models that we're seeing uh, in Kenya, we're working with uh, two organizations, BOMA and CARE, um, uh, for a government-led uh, graduation pilot. And for CARE, they use um, volunteers, and they're known as community-based trainers, and they're essentially volunteers who are paid an allowance. So they're not technically CARE staff, um, but they are volunteers, and um, they're not retained after the project is over. But they do, prov um, the intention is to keep them on for a fee for service basis um, if participants need additional coaching. And you know, they go through that similar uh, training process that BRAC would provide uh, to its staff. Um, so yeah, it really varies. And um, you know, as we you know, as we enter this new era of graduation 2.0, uh, looking into uh, increasing government adoption and uh, trying to reduce costs, or trying to see what is the most cost-effective way to deliver graduation. There's a lot of research, or at least we're hoping there will be a lot of research on uh, the different modalities of coaching. So Fundacion Capital, who's a big player in the graduation space. Uh, uses tablets um, and an e-coaching component uh, to reduce some of the human resources cost that would be associated with coaching. Um, and you know, I think there's research. Um, there's a lot of potential for research to see what um, what is effective um, as we try out these different methods. Um, and even in Bangladesh, you know, over the past couple of years, we've uh, tried different. Um, modes of coaching where we've done individual household visits and then we've also done group coaching to sort of cut down some of the costs but then also because we're uh, realizing that participants learn better through groups and um, you know this also gives them access to a, a network that they didn't have before um, but primarily you know it, it also does help reduce some of the costs of staffing great thanks nausea um unless anybody else um um, put in a question while we're talking about this this last one this might be our last question but I do encourage we've got a little bit of time if anybody has any other burning questions um, please do please do type them into the chat bar um, just one other question that's come in around um, around the the stipend the consumption report support which is a core part of the um, the graduation model um, in BRAC I understand it's I guess part cash, part a mixture of rice and lentils. Um, in the analysis that you did, was there was this looked at in um, in any way in terms of the the different support, the difference between I guess cash support and in kind support, and the relative importance of um, of either? Uh, no, actually, uh, so during that phase of the program, it was uh, one block transfer. So it was, uh, we, we didn't quite uh, differentiate uh, between the type of support that was provided. So uh, it, it wasn't something we were able to isolate, whether just giving lentils and rice versus just cash or a combination of the two. Uh, it, we wouldn't be able to answer uh, from the existing data uh, which component works best. Maybe that can be your next study. Uh, can I? Oh, sorry, I Absol just wanted to add uh, that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Nazia, sorry. sorry. 
I just wanted to add that in the in the current phase, uh, we no longer provide in uh, the TP model. We uh, we no longer provide um, uh, in kind food transfers, and it's all a consumption stipend. So it's the full amount is given uh, in cash, and participants are you know advised on eating a certain diet for uh, for the week. But uh, we no longer do food transfers. Right. And uh, uh, we're we're currently piloting uh, a similar program in Uganda that's targeted specifically towards uh, youth. Uh, we do uh, kind of uh, mobile money transfers here as well. So yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, all right, we've come to the end of the questions, but Wamak, Nadia, Matthew, was there any think any question that you think you really wish? somebody had asked or is there anything else that you would like to add before we um before we wrap up i'm good thank you okay not yet, um, matthew no, um for me not no i think uh most of the questions touched on kind of the, the things we're grappling with in terms of how do we mobilize this kind of mechanism on this modality uh, I probably would have liked to question around how we integrate social protection schemes at a national level with these types of interventions. I think this is a, a key area or topic for consideration going forward and something that um, Save the Children and other actors, particularly BRAC, I'm sure, are, are definitely grappling with now. And how do we integrate, particularly with nutrition, how do we get the health um, mechanisms for example the ministry of health and nutrition centers heavily involved in this and utilizing their human resource capacity and moving um, beyond um, development program staff doing a bulk of the work or using volunteers or building a professional volunteer network for example over time that's some of the mechanisms we're looking at in myanmar so i think that's more of a, a broader question on how we we work with them um, at the more systems level beyond household interventions um, yeah, similar to Matthew, uh, you know, I was hoping for a more conversation around the intersection of graduation with social protection. Uh, and, you know, as we uh, start working in areas in, you know, in very remote areas in Africa where we're seeing the cost of per participant for graduation approach is extremely high. Um, so really looking at, um, you know, which acts as a deterrent for governments to adopt the graduation approach. So a uh, conversation around how you convince governments and um, how to you know improve effective messaging around graduation for governments to adopt it and um, you know as a complementary approach to social protection would have would have been great but um, uh, nonetheless thank you uh, so much to everybody for a wonderful conversation all right great thank you so much thank you um Natsia, Wamek, and Matthew, it's been, it has been a very good, um, good discussion. Um, and thank you very much too for, um, to our colleagues at socialprotection.org for, um, for ho hosting this, this webinar. Just a quick mention of um, some upcoming um, webinars by SPEC. So the next one is going to be on the um, the report of the South South Knowledge Collaboration Workshop on Social Protection Programs for Employment that was held in Manila um, earlier this year, and another one on Peru's social protection system in relation to linking to employment. Um, so keep an eye on the notifications for that. Um, you can also access the publications on this topic and participate in any other activities by becoming a SPEC member and the. Um, the details of that um, should be given in the last slide, but I'm not sure it's up there at the moment, but um, the details are on, um, on socialprotection.org if you are interested in becoming a SPEC member. So with that, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate the participation um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you.